Well, one of the things we love to do in this church is part of our vision is to help you catch your own vision. And then once you start to see what that looks like, we want to support and we want to undergird and we want to help you step out in what you feel like the call of God is on your life. I'm not interested in you showing up here and serving my vision. I'm not interested in you coming up here doing a bunch of Christian programming, you know, where you do all these programs and busy works and classes and this prayer and that and this session. And you feel like you're serving God because you've done a bunch of church Christian busy work. I'm, I'm not interested in that. But once you decide, you tell me, you know what, I really kind of feel like this is where God's leading me. This is God's, what God's calling me to do. You may not know all the details, but at least it gives us a track to walk on, you know. It gives us a path to start to pursue. And so I love it. I enjoy it. It's so important to me to be able to do that. And in honor. So Kate and Tori have shown up, and they're amazing. Don't you appreciate them? Kate's running the kids' church back there. And Tori's walking this thing out, taking care of his young family, working a job, and, and just, you know, in fact... We, we appreciate you, man. I know that your brother is sick um, in the in ICU. You're, you're talking about that openly. It, it looks like that he doesn't have much time left, barring a miracle, and, and we've prayed, and we've all seen that happen. God is faithful, but this world is broken. So, you know, in the, I know that you're hurting right now, and I know that you're thinking about him, and I know that you've been going up there and spending time with him, and we think about you and your family, and we lift you up. But we're proud of you, and we're honored to be the place that supports and nurtures this gift. Amen. So y'all welcome Tori as he comes up, Mr. Stills today. You can turn those side lights on if you would, Hans. Holy Ghost? Okay. All right. Yeah, um, for any of you guys that are, like, sitting on your gift, I got to echo what Clint is saying. You know, I, I came with my own church baggage from the last place, and I'm not blaming it on my previous pastors. It's just when you first come to Christ, you come with your own ideologies and your own issues. Um, but, you know, one time Clint asked me, he said, um, you know, are, do you still want to pursue this? Do you still want to, you know, get involved to the degree with which you've been getting involved? Because I know you said you still got things to work out. And I told Clint, the reason why I'm running full speed ahead with this body right here and serving in the greatest capacity that I can with the time that I have is because this is a place of freedom. And so I don't know if any of you guys have had any church baggage, if you feel like there's a call in your life or there's more you want to do for God, if you're interested in getting involved in the place like this right here and serving more, I just encourage you, don't sit on your gift. This is a place of freedom. It really is. And so um, I just encourage you guys to leverage the freedom that's within this place to figure out what is it that's on your heart. What do you feel like God is calling you to? And, you know, um, and I'll, I'll say this, this other thing right here. I was telling uh, Clint and Mike shortly after my wife and I started visiting here, I've never been in a body of believers when I look around the place and there are so many people that I want to be like. The things that are in some of you guys' life, uh, the, the inspiration with which you carry, the, the innovation, um, the creativity, my God, Stacy, like, and, and for a while now, I don't know if you guys have ever had any conversations with Stacy, but Stacy is a very unique individual. I'm not trying to prophesy anything. Like, I'm, I'm just saying, like, for instance, someone like Stacy, I find so many times when I have a conversation with somebody like Stacy, I am inspired. I feel like I'm hearing from the very mouth of God when I have a conversation with this young lady right here. And so I just wanted to say you're, you're precious. You're valuable to God. And I say that to all of you. And in fact, I'm going to be talking a little bit about evangelism here. But one of the main things that I always tell people, um, even after I found out that, that they're Christians, I tell them that you're very precious and you're valuable to God. God has a special plan for you. And so I never lose any excitement over that. You know, there is a supernatural element that happens when you step out to share with people and that's exciting. It's cool. But for me, I'm learning the more that I step out and tell people how much God loves him. When there is nothing supernatural happening, I feel like just the opportunity to tell someone that God loves you, you're special to him, you're precious and valuable to him. I get just as much fulfillment out of saying that to a person as much as something supernatural would happen. And so um, 
So with that being said, today I, I, I want to talk about a lifestyle of sharing. I had to pull out my laptop today because I had a tablet and um, I had all my notes and stuff on it. Somehow we were at the apartment and the internet crashed and so I just put everything on my laptop and so I got this big clunky thing right here. And so, um, another, another thing I, I kind of feel inclined to talk about, when we were doing um, communion, I used to struggle years with communion. Um, I just, it just didn't really hit home, it just didn't connect with me, it didn't, I didn't really, it didn't connect with me. And so, but since I've been coming here, my, ex, my personal experience with communion has really, really been enriched. And I tend to think a lot about sharing in communion. And in this vein of a lifestyle of sharing, sharing God's goodness, sharing Jesus um, with the lost, there's an, idea, there's an aspect of this inheritance, this adoption that we've been given in Christ that's just, a much, just as much about the responsibility, a shared responsibility we have in God's heart towards the lost as much as we share this, uh, this blessing and promise that Jesus has given us. And so 2 Corinthians 1 talks about all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. And we know that we share all of his promises, but in that same vein, we share that responsibility, that heart that Jesus has towards the lost. And um, I'm, I'm, I don't have these in my notes right here. I'm just thinking about certain scriptures, but 1 Corinthians 1.9 talks about we have been called to the fellowship of Jesus. And that word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, and it's talking about sharing. And so in that vein, and not only do we share all of the promises that Jesus obtained when God raised him from the dead on behalf of every person, but we also share a collective responsibility with God's heart towards the lost. And so I'm hoping that as I share about sharing today, you guys will be inspired about that. You guys ready? Are we good? All right, cool. So first two things right here, let's talk about knowledge and let's talk about exposure. And so knowledge is the framework with which we build our lives upon. If you look at it out in the world, we've got all these different denominations, we've got cults, we've got all these different religions that have established their lives on the bedrock of the knowledge that they've given themselves to. And so it's important for us, if we want to recognize and, and, and respond to God's heart, this idea of sharing, then we have to get our knowledge right. We have to get our knowledge right. And so there are very specific passages that we're going to go through today that I constantly think about, I constantly read, I constantly pray. There's not a whole lot of songs out there about the Great Commission. We'll talk about that, but it's important for us to be inspired to be the people that God has called us to be, that we want to have the right knowledge. And so this other thing that I thought, so I, I, I put this in here, knowledge, knowledge leads to biblical conviction. And then this other thought right here about exposure is that um, I found that a lot of, I, I went to a Christian college back in 2011, and I found that most of the Christians there that I talked to, um, it was very uncommon that they rub shoulders with any person that was not a Christian. And so I think that there's a lack of exposure that we have to the lost. And so with that being said, when it comes to exposure, being around lost people and their brokenness and their different situations, we, wanna, we don't want to treat them like they're unbecoming. And, you know, I'm, this job I got right now, <laughs> my, I got a new ship I'm working for from 5.45 a.m. to 1.45 a.m., uh, 1.45 p.m., and you would not believe some of the conversations I have with these guys. I mean, there are some really, really off-the-wall conversations. But I'm thankful that I have this exposure to these people because I'm convinced that knowledge by itself, you only got an argument. It leads to contention. And I was that guy when I was in, at a Christian college. I knew the word about, about the Great Commission, our responsibility to share Jesus with other people. But the only thing I was about as good at was, was an argument. And I argued with a lot of people. I was very contentious. Um, there was a lecture we had one time. Um, um, there was a person, well, the professor, and there was a person who had lost a loved one um, in a boarding accident. And we got to talking about salvation 
And I remember them saying that it was God's will that that person died that way because they tried to go and raise a person up. The person ended up dying. The person wasn't a believer. And so they're saying they started getting off into this idea of predestination that basically God chooses whom he wants to save and he chooses um, who goes to hell. And I remember something made me just snap. <laughs> and we were going back and I was going back and forth with this girl. And by the end of the lecture, the entire classroom was standing up, pointing fingers at me. I mean, they were very, very angry because I was I was content. I was trying to stand for the truth. But arguments really don't don't persuade people. They don't. And so knowledge by itself will only give you an argument at best. And on the flip side, if all you have are is exposure where you're exposing yourself to these opportunities where people that are lost, whether it be missions trips or an orphanage or a soup kitchen, you name it. But if you're doing this by your, if, if you're subjecting yourself to exposure alone, then what you're left with is, is a burden and in a sense condemnation because you're doing this in your own strength. And, and so the idea that I'm trying to bring together right here is that we take the knowledge of God's word, which leads to a biblical conviction, and then we take exposure, which gives us opportunities to obey the word of God. When we put those together, when we've got the knowledge, God's word, biblical conviction, and we've got exposure, while well, we're spending time with people who don't know Jesus, when we bring those together, we, gives our, we give ourselves an opportunity for the grace of God to work on the inside of us. And so we've got knowledge, and we've got exposure, and as we're submitting ourselves to those two things right there, we're, we're allowing the grace of God to come on the inside of us. And so Philippians 2.13 says that it is God who works in us, giving us the power and the desire to do what pleases Him. So that's where we want to be right there. And so we want to, like I said, we're going to go through some verses here. We want to have an established biblical conviction based on the Word of God, and then we want to take exposure, opportunities to just love on people who don't know Jesus. And even if you aren't in the best situation, the most convenient um, life to make room for the lost, there's still room for you to share God's goodness with your fellow believers. And so let me go ahead and um, move along right here. So I got a few questions for you right here. So the first question is, what do I believe God wants for every person? Just think about that. What do I personally believe that God wants for every single person? Just think about that. What do I believe God wants for every person? Question number two, what do I believe my part is concerning God's plan for people? And when I say people, let's... let's Let's just shift here and let's let's just make it plain. What do I believe my part is concerning God's plan for lost people, people who don't know Jesus, people who didn't grow up in church, people who aren't saved? What do I believe my part is concerning God's plan for their salvation? And so this third question right here, what role do I believe I play concerning the lost people in my family? the people that I go to work with, and the people that I come in contact with on a regular basis. What do I believe about that? And so I kind of want to share a story. I mean, I got, <laughs> I got tons of stories that I can share, but I was trying to be sensitive and selective about which stories to share. I want to be respectful of everybody's um, time. Um, so a lot of exciting things have been happening at work since I was working the, the night shift and now I'm working the morning shift. And so... So, like these questions right here, I was just asking, what I tend to do, sorry about that, what I tend to do, whether I be at work, I mean, this is something I do on a weekly basis. Often, when I'm driving, I'll be in my car on the interstate on the way back from work or to work, and I'll look at the car next to me, and I often, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is God programming my thinking, it just, it just happened, I happen to think this way. And so, as I'm driving, and I look at the people in the, in the lane next to me, I often think, is that person, does that person know Jesus? What is it that God, if God had reigns to just, if, if God could sit down and have a conversation with that person, what, what would God say to that person? What is it that that person 
needs to hear. And, and evidently, there's nothing I can do. We're on the interstate doing 70 to 110 miles an hour, depending on how you drive. You know, there's nothing I can do about that. But I often let myself go there because I don't, I want, I want my heart to be open to God. And I want my heart to be open to people. I really, really care about that. And, you know, sometimes when I feel myself getting a little dry or a little stale or just disconnected and just doing my own thing, I'll often go back to that place. And if I'm like right now we're living in an apartment, I did this just the other day where because, you know, I've been distracted by my brother. And, you know, sometimes life hits hard and you get sad and you can easily become numb to people. You can easily forget about those who are around you. You can just get so lost in your pain and your situation. And I was hurting. (laughs) And so what I did was, you know, Kate was out uh, working here at the church and I put Miles down for a nap. And I just got in my little office chair and I just got quiet. And I could hear the people walking outside in front of outside of our apartment. I can hear the neighbors up door. Y'all, these neighbors, they're... um, I, th- I think they're from the Philippines. They're beautiful. They just had a little girl, and they just brought her home the other day. And so I thought, what is it that God wants for the people above me? What is it that he wants to do? What is it that if they could hear one thing from God that would just change the trajectory of their life, what would that be? What would that be? And I think what I'll often come back to, it sounds like I'm beating the dead horse, is that God loves you. <laughs> You're special to him. He has a plan just for you that nobody else can fit into. He loves you and he's got a plan for your life. And often what happens is when you have these moments where you let yourself go and you let your heart feel what God feels for people, you tend to have these moments of inspiration that interrupts their day and it can lead to them getting healed. It can lead to their salvation. It can lead to many, many wonderful things. And so... I want to share this story with you right here. And so I drive what's called an order picker. It looks like a reverse forklift, if you guys know anything about what that is. And so often while I'm driving, I'm just kind of, you know, driving my my piece of machinery. And um, sometimes if I'm, I'm just getting bored and I'll just go back to this place right here. It's just, it's in me. And I go, hey, God, what, what is it that you want for the people around me? What is it that you have for them? And I'm just letting you know, Lord, that my heart's open to you. If there's something that I could share, I'm, I'm open. I, I just, I just want to be in tune with you with what you have for people. And recently, I had a dream. Um, I tend to dream a lot. I'm not trying to say it's some gift or anything like that, but I'm thankful for it because God communicates with me when I'm asleep. Because when I'm awake, now that I have a two-year-old son and a little girl on the way, I'm a little bit more reluctant to step out and be there for people just because I got a family to take care of. And it's a real struggle, but I always ask God to speak to me. And so I had this dream that this girl, shoot, I was going to try to (laughs) be neutral. But anyway, um, I had a dream about this girl that I work with. And in this dream, she was being tormented in her dreams. And there was this heaviness, there was oppression, um, I wasn't sure if she was struggling with any suicidal thoughts or anything like that, but there was a darkness that was just following her like a little black dog. And, and it remind, it really resonated with me because it reminded me of the things I used to struggle with before I became, um, before I came to Christ. And I used to struggle hearing voices. I used to be extremely suicidal and I was on medication for depression and anxiety. And so this dream, I mean, I woke up at, gosh, it was like one o'clock in the morning and I had to be at work at 545. And so I kind of stayed up thinking about that dream. And I thought, okay, well, that was pretty specific. So what I'll do is I'll finish my shift and I'll approach this coworker and just see if there's anything to it. And so I didn't really think about it much at work. I was doing my job. And by the end of my eight hours, I approached her and I go, hey, so-and-so, um, this might seem a little odd. And if you guys ever have these moments of inspiration when you're stepping out, you don't have to be weird. You don't have to, like, give it all at one point. Just ask a simple question. And so I asked, 
this may be a little weird to you, but I asked, have you been having trouble sleeping? And she goes, well, yeah. And I go, okay. Have you been struggling with any dreams at all, any bad dreams that have been tormenting you? And she takes a step back. And so I go on and ask her more specific questions about her situation. And she tells me that she has. And she goes, why did you have that dream? And then I go and tell her, I was like, well, I don't know what you believe, but I'm a Christian and I believe that God loves people. I believe that we're special to him. It's why I gave my life to Jesus. And I believe he also wants to make me a blessing to people. And so while I'm riding my picker, I trust God to show me things about people um, that he would trust me with and that they would trust me with because I believe that God wants to be a blessing and he wants to help people. And so I told her, I used to struggle with some of those similar things and Jesus delivered me from that. And she goes, I have to show you this right here. And so I'm going to read what uh, she sent me. She said just the day before, she pulled, she's into tarot cards and she's into Mother Earth being wisdom and all that. I, I thought, okay, that's interesting. And she said, um, I pulled a tarot card. Let me read it here. It says um, Nine of Swords. So the name of the tarot card is Nine of Swords. And I didn't really get a lot into tarot cards, but as a kid, me and other friends, we used to play with them. I don't know where we got the set from, but we used to play with them. And so I was I was into some some weird stuff at a young age. But this is what the card says right here. Um, joy, joylessness, despair, nightmares, insomnia, hormonal menopause. That's one thing. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Migraines. And she did tell me that she was struggling with all of those things on that bottom list right there. And so I asked her, I said, Again, I don't know what you believe, but I just told you the God I believe in. And I said, do you believe God was showing me something about your life because he loves you? And she said, must be. And she said, funny thing is, I grew up Catholic and I was dedicated, but I just lost all my value for it. And I just started doing this other thing. And I told her, this is the last thing I told her right here. And immediately my manager walked over. Now at my job, they have a, you don't talk about politics. You don't talk about religion. They have like a zero tolerance policy of that. And so um, I told her, I said, the same wisdom, the enlightenment and the truth that you're seeking after, it's found in Jesus. And I said, I'll give you my number, my wife's number. If you are, if, if this is something that you want, or if these dreams continue to, to plague you, call us and we will show you who Jesus is. We'll, 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 we'll give you Jesus. And I said, he'll change your life. And immediately my manager came over and and so the week goes by and she thanked me for it. And she said, nothing really has been happening. She hasn't had any more dreams, but there was a seed planted right there. I don't know what else will happen. She'll see me. And I told her, I'm not going to push Jesus on you. I said, I want you to know I, I believe in Jesus and I, I want you to believe in him too. I believe he'll, he'll make the difference in your life. But I said, if you are, if you're any more interested and if you have any questions, Feel free to call me and my wife and I. We'll have you over. We'll talk about it. And we'll get you back on track. And she was incredibly thankful. Now, I don't, I don't have a lot of moments like that. And it was pretty cool. But I go back to what I was saying earlier. Even if something like that never happened, if I didn't have a supernatural thing like that happen, just the privilege of telling someone how much God loves them, it thrills my heart just as much as having a dream for somebody. And so... I want to share some passages right here about um, the Great Commission. And so this point right here is remembering Jesus' final words. Let's go to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Is Gail in here today? I don't see Gail. I'm, I'm going to be uh, reading this from the uh, Christian Jewish Bible. Uh, Gail and I, we've been having a lot of conversations lately about the Jewish festivals and the holidays and their significance. And so as I was reading this, I thought about her. So if you're watching, Gail, um, I chose this translation just out of the um, great conversations we've had. And so um, we don't have it in here, but I'm going to be reading it um, from my laptop. Yeshua came. Yeshua came and talked with him and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Therefore, go and make people from all nations until into this word right here says Talmudin. It's the it's the uh, Hebrew word for disciples. Um, immersing them. I love this right here. It says immersing them into the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Ruach Hakadesh, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always until the end of the age. Now, this this right here, there's a couple of other ones I'm going to read through. It's known as the Great Commission. And in conversation with a lot of Christians, some people believe that the Great Commission, because he was speaking to the apostles, he was speaking to the 12, uh, well, the 11 at the time, that the Great Commission was only delegated to those who are particularly called into the office of an apostle or the fivefold ministry. And so I want to share some other passages that will, if you guys have thought that before, if anyone watching may have um, had that misunderstanding, I'm hoping that you will see your place in the Great Commission so that you'll be inspired through a biblical conviction of God's word to have that exposure with the lost and allow the grace of God to come on the inside of you and you fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. Amen. So let's uh, go to the next um, one. Mark 16, 15 through 20. All right. I think I'm a second. There we go. All right. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, I'll make a point here. Some people believe that the whole, and Clinton has done an amazing job addressing this right here. Salvation is not done through, salvation is not given through baptism. Baptism is a ceremony. It's a ritual that we partake in saying that, hey, we identify with the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so um, we're going to be having baptism, um, a baptism service at the end of the month. And so if you guys have never been baptized, is really an incredible opportunity for you to identify with Jesus in a powerful and unique way if you've never done that before. Um, all right, so verse... All right, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word, the accompanying signs. And later on in Acts, what you'll find is that when Jesus is giving his final address right there, he's not just speaking to the twelve. Um, he's speaking to other believers that were present, the 120 that were in the upper room. Um, and so the Great Commission, and, and I know sometimes, you know, there's taboo with the word preach or we get intimidated by the word preach. It's the Greek word cariso, which means to proclaim. It means to share enthusiastically. It means to publish. And so it doesn't mean to stand up here with a, on a pulpit with a microphone and to preach from the top of your lungs. There's a way that we all can share. And later on, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about authenticity what that looks like in terms of you sharing in your own world, even if you're not a pastor or an apostle or an evangelist um, or teacher or prophet. And so, and then, let's see here. All right. All right, so I want to um, I want to talk a little bit about seeing what he sees in us, and so and, and so can everybody see that? Like, I'm not trying to wax eloquent. I'm 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 sharing scriptures here about what Jesus said. That's for every single believer. Are, are you guys able to see that? We are all called to fulfill the Great Commission, and it doesn't mean that we're all supposed to go overseas. It doesn't mean that we're all supposed to stand in the pulpit. It doesn't mean that. We're all supposed to start an orphanage or whatever stigma you may have um, concerning the Great Commission. But in our own personal worlds, we are all called to fulfill the Great Commission. We are. Even you, Travis. 
<laughs> and so, seeing what he sees in us. Uh, let's, let's read this right here. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. And I'm going to be reading from the message. We don't have this um, in our program, in our database up there, but I'm going to be reading it from my laptop. But I love the way that the message puts this right here. All right, so here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If you make light bearers, you don't think that I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand now that I put you there on a hilltop on a light stand. Shine. Keep open house. <laughs> be generous with your lives. Be opening up to others. You will prompt people to be open with God, this generous Father who is in heaven. So everywhere that we go, we are light bearers. He didn't look, Jesus didn't call us peasants. He didn't call us inferior in any type of sense. He said that we are the salt and the light of the world. And another translation, as we just read up there, it says that we're supposed to produce these good works so that they can glorify our Father in heaven. And we, we can talk about what those good works are. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done um, in this day and age right now. But the way Jesus sees you is that you are in him. You are his right hand man and woman. And you're called to bring others to him through the light, the glorious light of the gospel. Amen. OK. And so this right here, let's go to Luke 5, 1 through 10. Actually, I think it's 4 through 10. This is one of my favorite stories right here. Um, you see Peter, you know, the Gospels, they outline them sort of differently. But you see Peter here being a fisherman, and Jesus was preaching on the lake, preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom on the lake. And in it, he beckons for Peter to push the boat out a little bit farther. And you see, as Jesus was communicating um, with Peter and this miracle that happened, you see the way that, G that Peter actually saw himself. It wasn't really aligned with how Jesus saw him. And I think that we tend to struggle with how we see ourselves. We tend to think much less of the esteem that God has for us. You know, and I'm not trying to change this philosophy at all. I know we talk about the idea of do, doing things for God and for Jesus. But when you look at scriptures, you see that scripture, send, scripture tends to depict this idea that there's a unity, there's a unison that we share with him. And so let's, let's read through the story right here. Um, I think we're starting at verse four, I believe. I'm just going to start from one. My, my laptop has this laid out kind of weird. I'm sorry about that. Let's, let's go to verse one. Now, it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, Jesus was standing in the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put, out, put a little out from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets, let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I'll do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled... And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And I think, I'm sorry if I get a little emotional about this, but I just remember before I gave my life to Christ, I used to struggle a lot with suicide because there was a lot going on in my trailer. <laughs> You guys heard about that last time I spoke. And it just felt like nobody loved me. And I thought, man, I'm so angry. If I take my life, it would make a statement and really, really 
punish the people that I feel like that failed to neglect me. And God is my witness. Often as I would contemplate suicide, and I tried it two or three times um, with the medication that I was taking, the thing that the growing image that I had on the inside of me stopped me in my tracks from actually crossing the line. And this is what would happen. As I'm contemplating suicide, I would just have this rage filled on the inside of me. And before I would actually commit that terrible act, I would see me being on a stage and a sea of people and people with their hands lifted. And I knew that that was me helping people. I didn't know that it was God telling me about a call in my life or anything like that. I just knew that that was so special and it spoke such volumes of value to me that I couldn't take my life when I realized that, when I realized the impact that I could have on a multitude of people. And at the time, I struggled with what that meant. And I didn't know that was God reaching out to me, but it seized me, it stopped me in my tracks. And now when I think about that, and I read this right here, Peter had no clue the value that Jesus saw in him and himself. And I just want this story right here to speak to you so that you would know that God sees you. You have way more potential than you realize. You have way more to offer to your family, to your coworkers, to the people you encounter on a regular basis through those coffee shops or restaurants that you, 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 uh, you frequent. But God has a plan for your life to not only enrich you, but to use you to enrich the people around you. And so what Jesus was communicating to Peter right here was that, that, that idea. And so let me go on right here. So he said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James, John, and son, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Peter said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. And so here I want to talk for a second about authenticity. You know, we've got, you know, the, the Christian association, fishers of men. But what I see here was that Jesus was looking at a group of people in their profession and he was contextualizing their call. And so let me ask you, what is your profession? What is the thing is it that you're doing with your hands right now? Is it, is it music? Do you have a desire to do music, to share your music with people? Well, in that same vein, God will use your music to entice, to lure, to bring people, to draw people to Jesus. If you're a businessman, if you're a salesperson, God will use you and your vernacular, your set of words, your set of skills to sell people on this reality that Jesus is real and that He can change a lot, that He's got a plan for them. So it doesn't matter if you feel as if, you know, your profession, the thing that you do, your job, your nine to five doesn't really support the mission, His mission, our shared joint mission. If you're in Jesus and you're a businessman or if you're whatever, you fill in the blank, there's a way for you to, con Jesus wants to contextualize your call to bring people to Him. Amen? Amen. So, and I'm reminded of that because I, y'all, I, I drive a picker. <laughs> And it's not fun. There's no heat. There, I mean, there's, there's no AC in there. I mean, it's, it's sweltering heat every single day. There aren't any ceiling fans, but I'm there. And, um, and I, I, let, me, let me share this right here. So recently I've had, I've been kind of like a the buzz topic at my workplace because since I switched over to the shift, a lot of the guys, um, they're kind of upset that I'm working hard all the time. It kind of makes them look bad, I guess, or whatever. And I'm like, I'm busting my butt off. And um, lately, these guys have been kind of testing me with some really, really strange conversations. And so I've learned that there's two particular crises that are going on at this, uh, this workplace. The first one is balding. Everybody that works there, since they've joined this place, they've lost their hair. And they're all balding. So that's, that's the first crisis I've discovered right there. The second one is that of the guys I work with, about 20 guys, 10 of them have gone through divorce since they started this job. 
And so usually I'm more apt to initiate these conversations, but I've just been kind of listening and and so asking them, hey, man, like one guy asked the other day, like, what, what went wrong? Like, it hurts my heart to hear that because I love being married. It's, it's a challenge, but man, I love being married and it breaks my heart to know you're going through this. And he goes on to say, well, you know, about that, that fourth year mark, you know, like you just kind of lose the flame. And, and I was like, fourth, fourth year? I just had my fourth year anniversary. And he's like, oh, you'll see. <laughs> and I use this opportunity right here because I've already kind of earned trust with some of these guys. And so I go on to say, hey, man, like, I view things a little differently. And I go on to say that the reason why I feel like my marriage is afloat is because I make Jesus the center of my marriage. And he's given me an entirely different value for women. He's given me the grace and the power to be selfless. Because, I mean, I was like, think about it, man. Like, when you guys are at a standstill and you're both button heads, somebody's got to compromise. That's not always easy to do. And I told him, Jesus has helped me just to, to do just that. And I'm thankful for him. I was like, maybe you should. And I said, maybe you should consider Jesus, too. And he looked at me kind of sideways. And he thought, man, that's different, man. That's, that's different. That's different. And so that was that conversation, which led to six or seven other conversations people have had about me because, yeah, hey, man, Tori, Tori handles things differently, so differently. And, y'all, it's easy because I'm not, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just I'm being who I am in Jesus. And when you're in an environment like that, when the darkness is really, really dark, there's not a whole lot that you have to do. You just be you. You love them. Don't don't turn your lip up at some of the colorful words that they use because they're they're going to talk dirty. They've got strange values. But remember, before you came to Jesus, like Paul said, we were all under the power, the power of the prince of the air and we were sons of disobedience. Remember that. So don't don't get on your high horse. Stay humble and love these people. And so this other conversation I had with a guy, I'm, I'm about to get back on track here, but there was another conversation. Um, it, we just can't be disgusted with the loss. We can't. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He loved people. And so this one guy, it's like, hey, T, man, let me talk to you, man. He said, what if, what if your wife, I'm not going to make it as graphic as he did, but he said, what if your wife cheated on you with another woman? Strange question, right? And so I go, Man, that's a really strange question. I said, I do have an answer for you. I said, one, so he asked me, would you, would you welcome that into your bedroom, basically? Or would you leave your wife? And I, and I go, one, man, that's a really strange question. I said, but I hear you, man. I said, one, that would be confusion for my children. I want my children to grow up in peace. I don't want my children to have confusion and all. So that's, that's one problem I got with it. And I said, two, I would be devastated and heartbroken for what has happened to my wife that she would do something so awful that would hurt me and hurt my son. It's like, I just can't imagine what is it within me that would drop the ball, that would neglect my marriage, that would allow it to come to a place such as this. I said, three, call me selfish, man, but I want my wife to myself, man. I'm not sharing my wife with anybody. And so he kind of laughed at it, but he thought, Man, that's it's like you you really are a good dude, aren't you? And here's why here's why I use this opportunity right here because I wasn't preaching. He's sharing his values, so I thought I could share my values too. And so he goes, "You're really good." I said, "Hey, man, I'm not a good dude." I said, "I understand your mindset. We come from very similar communities." And I said, "Hey, man, Jesus has changed my value and my perspective for women. I don't see things that way." And I'm, I'm not dogging you out, man. I understand where you're coming from. I said, I'm, I'm not ashamed to rub shoulders with you, man. But I was like, God loves you. He has a plan for you. And he, not saying that you're a bad person, but I'm saying he can change your values to what, like you said, other people said, man, Tori's different, man. I was like, people can look at you and God will make your life a sign and a wonder. And he was like, wow. And so I'm just, I've been having a blast just having these conversations with people. I'm not being really preachy. And I'm not turned off and disgusted and I'm not aloof because they have they have 
poor values. That's just the environment that they were brought in. And so I'm looking at all these guys, all these guys that are divorced, all of these guys have multiple kids by, by multiple women, and it breaks my heart because I'm reminded of the environment that I came from. Someone at my high school shared the gospel with me and several other kids there, and it changed the trajectory of my life. And that cycle stopped with me. I'm the youngest of seven, four brothers, two sisters. My parents are 60 and 62, and they have a total of 25 grandkids. Me and another brother, we're the only two out of seven kids that are married. And we have a combined of about to be six kids now. But the rest of those grandkids, they're steeped in confusion. Some of them are in gangs. Some of them are doing drugs. Most of them are doing drugs. I mean, just the brokenness just goes on and on and on and on. But because someone stopped, like I mentioned last time I spoke, they went off the beaten path and they shared Jesus with me. And my son, Miles, <laughs> my son, Miles, is going to grow up in a home knowing the Lord. He's going to be taught by his parents, but he's going to grow up being taught by the Lord. Because back in 2008, someone stopped and shared the gospel with me. They shared Jesus. And, it's, and I still got things I'm working through, but my son is going to have a far more rich life than I can even imagine. And it's all because someone took note of their responsibility of the Great Commission and shared Jesus with me. And y'all, I'm, I so long for you guys to catch that vision. And you know, a lot of the arguments I got into when I was in college, you know, people called me an evangelist because I had the audacity to step out and tell people about Jesus. I laugh at that because I don't know if I'm an evangelist. I'm not assuming that call. What happened was I got some biblical conviction and I got some exposure. I rubbed shoulders with the laws and God has given me the grace to step out and just talk to people, to tell people that they're special, they're valuable. Jesus died for you. What if God raised Jesus from the dead? And that means that you can have a, a resurrection of life. What do you need a resurrection for? Are you depressed? Are you angry? <laughs> Are you sick? Jesus wants to give you new life. And I'm so inspired by that. And I told, I told Clint, I will shake that tree all day long. I will beat that drum mercilessly because I want for people to know Jesus. And that exposure I was telling you about, I've got my... I had this conversation with my wife, Kate. I asked her, what was it that got you motivated about the loss and she never been asked that question before and so I kind of kind of fed her some questions and I asked her I said Kate used to do a lot of mission trips and it was her heart she loved it and I asked her I said babe had you never went to a third world country and saw the depravity of man in that regard in that element do you think that had you not had that exposure that there would be a chance that the loss would even be on your radar? And she told me no. And I questioned if I had not had, let's say that someone shared the gospel with me, and I had the knowledge, I had the biblical conviction, but let's say I was raised in a different family that wasn't so lost and so hurting and so steeped in darkness. Let's say I didn't have that exposure. I'm convinced that I wouldn't be as motivated to share Jesus with people. That's, that's just my stance on that. I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm sharing that philosophy with you and, and it's not something that I'm trying to strong arm you with and for you to forcibly agree with. But think about that. What kind of exposure do you have in your life with the lost? What kind of exposure do you have? And how do you what, what do you do with that exposure? What do you do with that? Do you, do you talk to them? Do you tell them that God loves them? Do you hear their story? What do you do with that? And so before we, uh, we close right here, I just want to share um, some simple ways that we can share. And I'll start with the most intimidating, the most terrifying. <laughs> How about that? We call it street evangelism. Some people call it prayer walk. And you go out on the streets 
with a team of people and you talk to people about Jesus. You tell them God loves them. You tell them God has a plan for them. You ask them, is there anything that you could pray with them about? <laughs> it's terrifying. I'm, I'm telling you, but because I've, I've had years of experience of doing that. And it still scares the heebie-jeebies out of me. But I do it because of the reward of someone having a seed planted that they may that may resonate with them later, or the opportunity of seeing someone get born again right there on the streets. And I've seen it dozens of times, not because I'm gifted or knowing it, but because I'm willing and I go. And Glenn, I know you've seen it before too. And so as I share these other few ways to share, just, just think about this right here. We're to be, I don't know much about farmers, but Paul said some plant, some sow, some water, um, and some reap a harvest. We're to be happy farmers. Say that, happy farmers. We can plant seeds of life, of God's goodness, of His love wherever we go with no pressure of what, what's going to happen, what, what's, what, what is gonna, what's going to become of that. But we can just share enthusiastically, and there's not a whole lot of pressure on us to make something happen because it's not us who brings salvation, it's Jesus. It's Jesus who brings salvation. And so going out on the streets, again, I think it's the most intimidating method, but it's a way to share. It's a way to get your feet wet, to go out and to learn to converse with people that you may never see again. And here's the catch. You go out, you may never see that person again. So what if you make a fool of yourself? So what? You're stepping out on the words of Jesus, his mandate, this shared responsibility. You're stepping out on that and you're taking God at his word. And it says that he went with them and those signs accompany those who believe. And you might see some really, really, really cool things happen. So it's monumental reward with minimal risk. And the risk is this. You might look like a fool. You might look like an idiot. It might hurt your ego, you know. But that's, that's it. That's it. That's it. All right. So let's talk about Shema. Um, in Deuteronomy 6, we don't have to put, put it up when it talks about hero Israel, that the Lord our God is one. And then it goes on, talks about how we basically will rehearse these truths. We will basically write them on the, what is it, the gauntlet? How do you say it, Mike? You might know. The gauntlet of your eyes. It talks about writing God's truth on your doorpost, writing them on your heart. And so you guys have heard about the explosion um, of the Christians in the church of Iran. There's a movement that's been taking place called disciple-making movements. And one of their strategies is called Shema in action. So what is Shema? Shema is basically the principle of hearing with the intention to obey. And so when you see that word um, in Old Testament passages, the word hear, it's Shema. It means to hear with the intention to obey. And what they do is they take the Great Commission and they go, how can I use my, my life to basically bring people to, uh, to Christ through acts of kindness, through prayer? And so when they, they do a lot of um, going out in, in, or street evangelism, so what they do is when they go on a prayer walk, they offer people prayer. Um, if they're out at a coffee shop, this is obviously um, strategies that we've adopted here in the U.S., and so when they go out to a coffee shop and they see someone and they want to bless them with a coffee, you know, they got that train going on in Starbucks all the time. Instead of just letting that train ride, we leverage that train. And if they ask, hey, why are you buying me a cup of coffee today? I just want you to know how much God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And so what you're doing is you're doing these acts of kindness and you're pointing it to God because anybody can do a good deed in their own name. But we do these good deeds. We take these actions. We go out and people ask, well, why are you praying for people? Or, or why are you out and about? Why, like, what are you sharing? We basically point it to God. And so these conversations that I've been having with people, um, I bought a guy lunch the other day. And he's like, man, Tori, you're so kind, man. I'm like, why do you do what you do? And I go, man, because I want you to know how much God loves you. I know you probably got enough money in your pocket to buy your own Chick-fil-A, but I'm doing it. Um, and since you're asking, I want you to know how much God loves you. And so we can do these acts of kindness. Great way. If you're 
if you're at a restaurant, leave a really, 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 really nice tip. And, and some of us, like my wife and I, you might have to save up to do that, but that's okay. We'll leave a really, really, really nice tip and just make a note on there and just tell them, hey, I just want you to know that God wants to take care of you. He wants to take care of you. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to live life on your own. He wants to be involved with you. And so that's, that's one way. Let's see. We're going to wrap this up. I see the time right there. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share these other things right here. So uh, social media, if you guys have never given your personal testimony on Facebook or Instagram, and that might be too much, that's okay. How about share the services that we have and just, that's a simple way to share. You just post, uh, well, Clint can give instructions about that, but you basically just take the link that we're sharing on Facebook and you can sh share that on your Facebook page. You never know who's watching. You never know who's watching. I've given my testimony on Facebook dozens of times and my wife Kate has some interesting people on her side of her family and she's told me the people who have been impacted just because I've taken time to share on Facebook. They would never step foot in the church. They would never let alone even talk to another Christian, but they've watched some of the things I've had to share and they've been impacted by that for some reason. Dear God, um, phone and old contact. If you guys have any random um, extra contacts in your phone that you haven't talked to in a really, really long time, this is something that they do in DMM, Disciple Making Movements. It's a strategy to just learn to share. So if you got an old contact that you haven't talked to in a really, really long time, call them, catch up with them, be genuinely interested and see how they're doing, and then use that as an opportunity to share what God is doing in your, in your life. Just share what God is, how God has been good to you. Just, just share what He's been doing in your own life. And so look, those, these are really, really, really simple ways to share. And I want to I wanna leave with this one last scripture right here. So this point says, experience Him and share Him. Let's go to 1 John 4, 7-8. NKJV. All right, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He does not know the love of God. Let me read that again. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so, some people use this point right here to say that if you're not walking in love, you're not saved. It's not what it's saying. But that word know is an experiential knowledge. And so a person who is walking in the love of God is evidently experiencing the love of God. And it's as simple as that. We experience, we, we share, we express what we're experiencing. And so it's important for us to stay motivated by the love of God because we don't want to be sharing in our own strength. We don't want to be sharing something that's not true, that's not real to us. But we want to be personally involved with God, we want to share. We want to share this experience with God to the point where we're motivated and inspired by His love to share that with other people. Because I've done it. When you're out there on the streets, let's talk about exposure. When you're exposing yourself to the laws and you don't have a biblical conviction, you don't have the love of God in your heart. It is really, really tough work. It's not fun. It's not fun at all. But when you couple that, that biblical conviction with that exposure and you're spending your time with God in these moments of worship, I often, I often think about the lost. And, and I thought I had a problem at one time because so often when we're worshiping, I often, I feel like I feel the heart of the Father. I'm not saying I'm special or anything. I'm just saying I feel like I tap into what He's feeling for the lost and what He desires for them. And I often cry and I often weep, not necessarily because I'm sad. That's a part of that. But in experiencing the love of God, that compassion just rises up on the inside of me. And I realize that, man, there's a dying world out there and God wants to get to them. He does. He wants to bless their socks off. He's got a word in due season for them. And so we are an extension of the body of Christ. We're His hands. We're His feet. Second Corinthians 5 talks about how 
You know, the, 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 the verse at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 talks about how we are new creations in Christ. So old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But then it goes on to say, it didn't just say, hey, man, you got the good stuff. It goes on to say that we are his ambassadors. And so probably could have been a little bit more structured. And I, I got a little emotional just thinking about all that's been going on. But I just want you guys to be inspired, to know that you are ambassadors for Christ. You are ambassadors for Christ in your workplace, in your family. You're his hands and feet. You're it. You're, you, God doesn't have a plan B. You're it. You're God's plan A. And he's, he, he's not going to change his mind about you, no matter what you may be struggling with, no matter where you feel like you are in your relationship with God or your spiritual maturity. He can use you right where you are. And so I just pray that you guys will be inspired. And um, I'll take a moment to pray out here. Father, I thank you that you have called us your sons and daughters. As, as John said that to those, to those who would believe on him, he's given us the power to be sons and daughters of God. And so, Father, we recognize our sonship, our daughtership, if you will, we recognize whose we are, that we belong to you. And Father, I just pray that we will be inspired to step into our role of fulfilling the Great Commission. That biblical conviction, I pray that we would give ourselves, we would expose ourselves to the lost around us, that we wouldn't be too busy, too busy, Father, to rub shoulders with those around us. And Father, we, <laughs> I just pray that we would be motivated by love because hearing something that's so awesome and incredible, an incredible responsibility, as intimidating as it can be, it's your love that motivates us and inspires us to action. And so, Father, I pray that they would be reminded, we all would be reminded of where you brought us, up, brought us from, that you rescued us <laughs> from the kingdom of darkness and you conveyed us into the kingdom of your son. You translated us. You translated us. I pray that we would be wholly aware of that and that we would just grow in our awareness of this great and awesome responsibility. Everybody say, I am an ambassador for Jesus. I am salt and light in this earth. I am willing to be Jesus in my world. He is in me. He is on me. He's working through me. And he's got good works for us to do in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Inspiring. You know, I would say mission accomplished. Now it's a matter of stepping out. So you and I know Glenn and there are probably others that have done this. Um, you're, you are going to go out on the streets. Yeah. We will make that known when that's going to happen. It's easier than you think if you just kind of put yourself out there. If that's something that you feel called to do, it's what you want to do. We'll make that known when these guys go out. And you just go and you watch. You don't even have to participate. You just go and you stand beside them and you watch. You can be the bodyguard. You can, you know, smile at least. But you just watch, get a little bit of experience, and then you never know. You might get a little word on your heart for them, and you just share it or a, path, a scripture comes to mind or, or whatever. But you just go. If that's something that you really feel like God's put on your heart, uh, it can make a difference. You know, it absolutely can make a difference. Because there are people out there that haven't heard the gospel. It's my story, too. Nobody shared with me the gospel. You know, it took encountering the devil on drugs to hear the gospel for me. You know, nobody took the time to share. And it's amazing. There are people all over, all over in the Bible Belt that have not heard the gospel. So we're for you. Appreciate you. And, and don't apologize for being emotional because you feel what you're saying, and it's powerful. So thanks, man. Show him, show him a little bit of love one more time. Thank you. 
la- last week uh, was supposed to be the just one presentation. They're calling it Guardians. There's a war on our children, and it's our job to protect them. Amen. Most of you guys know Caitlin Crane, Mike and Tracy's daughter, has an organization called Just One, and they're doing great work. They were going to do a presentation last week. The bug got her, and they're doing it this Friday, right? This Friday uh, here at what time? At 7 o'clock. And is there a registration for it? Just one.org slash events. It's free. Uh, and and we, we ha- or do we have more cards back there? Tracy, would you go out there and just, if you're on your way out, um, grab one of these cards. And, and again, like we had said, I mentioned before, maybe families in your community, because it, it's, it's a big part of the issue uh, of, of stopping the issue is awareness. Um, watching the spot for certain signs, knowing what's happening with the kids. We're talking about a trafficking issue. We even had in our local community a family that some of us know their child seemed to be lured by someone online and drawn into a life and gone out of state with them now. And it, it's just sad. To, we don't even know what all the details are, but there's grooming happening. And, you know, I, I appreciate what you said about don't despise the lost because in our culture right now, we're looking at all this stuff with all the sexual identity stuff and with abortion and all the different divisiveness that happens politically, it's easy to despise the loss. It's easy to become angered and throw away those that are waving the flags and calling it pride and it's just plain old sin and and it's in our face and it angers us and it's easy to just dismiss and discount and disregard. So I appreciate you saying that. Don't despise the loss. Sometimes people just don't know. Sometimes people don't know. And, and how else are they going to know? How else are they going to know? I was talking to Mike this morning. How else are people going to hear the gospel if they don't hear it from us? The church. How else are people going to know the ways of God if the church isn't out there being vocal? You know, we can have our church services. We can read our Bibles. But if we're not talking, if we're not opening our mouths, putting ourselves in a position, I mean, what are they, like, you, like you said, what are they going to do, reject you? Say something mean to you? So, yeah, appreciate you. Let's stand up on our feet, if you would. Those guys that are, if you need prayer for anything today. Tori, would you be available to pray too? If uh, <clears throat> if you, you know, what I believe in impartation. But what I believe impartation is, is somebody laying hands on you that is operating in a particular gift and it stirs it up in you. You have the spirit in you. You have the same spirit in you that raised Jesus from the dead. You have the same spirit in you that worked through Jesus when he was healing and doing all that he was doing. You don't need anything else from anybody, but I do think there is an element of stirring it up, maybe call it a spiritual energetic. I don't really know, but if it's something that you want prayer for, that you want to become more bold in stepping out and sharing your faith, then let Tori pray for you. Slide on over here and let him pray for you when we dismiss here. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather We do give you glory for the freedom that we have in this nation. May we protect it and preserve it. Uh, And may we, this is a joke here, just so you know, may we protect our pets from all these fireworks that are going to, because I know that's a big deal to some people. Uh, But Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to share our faith with people. We want to be emboldened. We want to step out. And we also want to be generous. We want to fund the work of ministry. So Father, I thank you that you are increasing the capacity of every person in this room and listening to trust you as their provider. And one way that we can show that we are trusting you is to give generously, not out of obligation, not out of compulsion, but just an act of faith with our money showing you I trust you. You are my provider. That's what you're doing when you give. When you give money, you're telling God, you're, you, with your whole being inside of your heart, you're saying, I don't trust in this money I trust in you as my provider, Lord. And so you sow it. Yes, you're sowing into the kingdom. Yes, you're sowing a seed into this ministry to help it reach more people and meet needs and do all the things that we get to do. But you're conditioning your heart to trust God as your provider so that the limits come off our finances for you. So, Father, I speak 
extravagant generosity, extravagant abundance on the hearts of the people, on the lives of the people here. We thank you, Father, for abundance, exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine according to the power that works in us so that you would be glorified through the generosity in this body that the gospel may go forward. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church slash connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.